Welcome to the NESG Radio. My name is Sadiq Olofi. I'm your host for today. Today, I have with me Dr. Zohun Abdapel, a senior fellow at the NESG Non-Residential Fellowship Program. Our discussion today will be focusing on the situation of the Naira, what are we doing wrongly, and what can be done to salvage the situation. So welcome to the show, Dr. Dapel. Pleased to be here. Thank you. So in the face of the continual fall in the Naira, we have seen different versions of it. How do you describe the foreign exchange situation in Nigeria, the Naira situation, the forex management, and some of the other issues around it? Yeah, thanks. Um, So your question summarizes everything that has to do with how we arrive at the current exchange rate. Right? So... The best approach to this question is first to look at the historical perspective, how the currency and its value has evolved over time. But if you look at the numbers closely, you would see that leadership plays a major role. The value of the currency changes when we have a change in leadership. And the change in leadership brings about change in policies that affect the value of the currency. But let's plow through some numbers. Um, the value of the Naira, uh, first, you know, we, we know that it was introduced in 1973 to replace the Nigerian British pounds, right? And the value at the time um, was pretty much stronger than the dollar and the pound. In fact, there's a period I call the glory day of the Naira, the glory days of the Naira. In 1985, uh, 1980, the value of the Naira was um, was was almost two times the value of the U.S. dollar. So you need one point, we need one dollar eighty cents to get one Naira at the time, and that was when Naira was at its peak. The currency had never returned to that peak and within when when democracy returned until this time the value of the currency has fallen by over 700 percent that's from 1999 to to date the value of the currency has fallen by roughly 700 percent so this is not to me an indictment um, on democracy uh, but it reveals the struggle of democracy to deal with pre-existing cracks within the system now in 1985 uh, powered by the drive for reforms and unrestricted controls of the value of the Naira the then government introduced a market for trading the currency with the, with, with the demand for and the currency determining its value so the exchange rate so what that means is um, demand and supply should determine the exchange rate so if there is more demand for the naira we are going to see the value of the naira go up and if there is more demand for the dollar than the naira we are going to see the value of the dollar go up goes up so in the immediate aftermath of this policy in 1985 the value of naira dropped by over 200 percent and by January 2000, coinciding when democracy returned, um, the value of the dollar has rose from less than one naira to more than one naira. And for roughly 14 years around that time, it maintained an average of approximately 143 in value. Then came the 2014 bust in world oil prices, which slashed Nigeria's oil revenue and external reserves and the value of the Naira um, was on a steepest downtown. downtown. So after reaching a level not seen in half a century, peaking to close to 500 to the dollar uh, as of February 2017, the currency's average between the month of oil price crash and September and September 2019 was 362 to to the pound. So, but this is just a background prior to 2015. But when we move into 2015, of course, around that time, the price of the oil fell. So let me just chip in something here. 
the the dollar is a currency we need to buy goods uh, from the rest of the world and our central bank is not authorized to print the dollar it's only America that is authorized to print the US dollars and Americans cannot just start giving us freebies of US dollar we have to earn it from them by giving them what they need in exchange and primarily what we have that ends with the dollar more than any commodity is oil so whenever there is a crash in the world oil price we see also uh, revenue coming in in terms of forex also falls and so there is a shortage of the dollar around the time now Nigeria is just one of the producers of oil it's only contributing maybe 2% or less to global oil output so it doesn't have leverage over the price of oil so these changes in world oil market situations we don't have control about it but what we do have control about is how we respond to these policies so from when the currency fell in 2015 the policy that the government at the time introduced to deal with the fall in the value of the currency uh, precipitated the situation amplified the situation made the situation worse and the currency continued to fall and what was it that the government um, introduced at the time so the government activated capital control measures and reduced access to the US dollar to many businesses and individuals needing them for legitimate things and because these individuals cannot access them from say the central bank or from commercial banks they have to access them elsewhere and so we see there was an explosion of the transaction of currency in the black market so the black market premium was rising sharp the black market premium is the difference between the official rate and the black market rate so the exchange rate in the black market went up and so when we're talking of the exchange rate what really concerns nigerians is not the central bank exchange rate it is the black market exchange rate because that's where they go to to get the dollar and so there was a rise in the black market rate at the time and the government was being um, advised to flood the naira to flood the naira means let the demand and supply of the naira determines uh, the exchange rate so if there is excess if there is more supply of the naira than the dollar in other words if Americans need the naira more than Nigerians need the dollar then the value of the naira would go up otherwise the value of the dollar would go down otherwise the value of the dollar would go up so that was what the government did around July 2016 and the situation worsened the value of the currency kept falling and when the presidency could not lean against the win of popular opinion they intervened by starting to supply dollar to uh, Beirut change and also commercial banks and trying to step back from allowing market to do that so why was um, the market um, behaving like that the, th- the reason is you it's a big policy error to to flow the currency in a financial system that is fragile because you open up the currency to speculative attacks and when these government bowed out of power the government that came in um, said they want to unify exchange rates and that is where we've seen the currency um, is almost on the brink of collapse and the value even the official value has gone up by almost 100 percent and so on and so forth yeah, so I'll just pause here for now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you, you, you've spoken a lot about some historical perspective to Forex management and the movement in Forex over the years. And um, you've been able to that emerged as a result of uh, policy changes, changes in government and all of those uh, issues around the government policy side. How do you how do you actually position the 
the fall in Naira beyond just just policy? So, um, beyond just policy, how do you position the fall in the Naira? So let's let's just understand something here. Um, the connection between the exchange rate and uh, and the welfare of Nigerians. Then I'll link it up to your question. So, the fact that the value of a country's currency is strong is not a guarantee that the welfare of the citizens will be robust or strong at the same time. We've seen in Nigeria in 1996 where we had the highest poverty rate that was 80%. Over 80% of Nigerians were living in poverty at the time. But the exchange rate was very stable for almost five years at 25 naira to the dollar roughly. So why was there no um, strong uh, welfare for Nigerians around the time? During the military juntas, the economic relationship between Nigeria and the rest of the world was not as strong as it is right now. So when democracy returned, the size of government expanded. You have House of Rep members, you have senators, you have governors, you have ministers, you have um, special advisors to ministers, you have commissioners, you have House of Assembly members, you have budgets of, EF, uh, of EFCC agencies established, you have, you also have INA with huge budget. So government expenditure expanded, government was spending a lot. And these people, they are all on the payroll of government. Now, they have a lot of cash at their disposal they have to spend, and much of that is on foreign goods. So we've seen people buying cars from abroad. We've seen people buying um, mobile phones being imported. Young graduates finishing getting jobs in federal agencies or banks, and they're buying cars. And that rose the demand for the dollar significantly. And that's why some people never figured out that just within the short administrative uh, window that Abdul Salami had to rule Nigeria, the value of the currency within his time dropped by um, over 60%. So that was around when these things were happening. So the value of the currency uh, was falling day by day because Nigerians were importing more uh, when democracy returned than when there was a military junta. So these, these things happen uh, without necessarily saying you want to put policies in place. So this is one of the, the biggest drivers. And another thing that has no connection with policy is in 2011, when election results were announced and there was some um, violence, lynching spree, people lost their lives. The message of that post-election in our announcement of result to investors was that your monies in Nigeria are no longer safe because there was a name on the ballot in 2011 and that name was hoping to appear on the ballot again in 2015. And the predictions around the time were that if this same name loses out of the election, what, what happened in 2011 would just be a piece of care would just be a tip of the iceberg so there will be more ravaging in the country and capital of investors would fall so if you look at nigeria's foreign direct investment um, around the time you would see from 2011 <clears throat> from that was the peak of foreign direct investment in nigeria it felt net flow so the net flow is um when foreigners bring in cap bring in money to invest they bring the dollar and there are existing investments in Nigeria who want to pull out their money. So if some if 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 investors bring in hundred dollars and hundred and fifty fifty dollars uh pull out of the economy, then the net flow is fifty dollars minus fifty dollars. So at the time we see the net flow was just falling because within two weeks, two weeks to the election, over twenty-five billion left Nigeria uh in Forex. And that's 10 times more than our capital expenditure uh, around that time. 
so that was a massive it created massive shortage of the currency and that has really no strong connection with uh with with policies of government but it was a situation that we found ourselves at the time oh thank you so i i i get get, get that um you are highlighting the fact that we have instability in our political system contributing to the fact that uh, investors are wary of coming to invest in nigeria and the expansion in the uh, in, in the demand for dollars as a result of uh, expansion in government in government spending. So I be, and from your responses, you have been able to touch on some of the implications that uh, could be for what, some of the welfare implication of um, the, 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 the status of, of the Naira. But I would like you to touch a bit more on what it's what, what is going to mean what 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 the situation of the naira means for the whole of the economic uh, interplay from the welfare of, of household welfare of businesses and that of the government how do you what what, what what do you think is the implication yeah so thanks um like i said um so the question yeah the way i understand your question is what has the value of the Naira got to do with the common man on the street, right? Um, back to what I said that during the military era, we had a very strong exchange rate, but that was when in 1996, we had the highest poverty rate in the country. So why was that? I explained that there was no strong economic relationship with Nigeria then uh, uh, with the rest of the world than we do now. I don't think Nigeria was importing more during the military era than it is right now because democracy brings about liberty, freedom, and politicians had a lot of means and money and people were spending. So, but in terms of uh, direct implication is it diminishes the country's international purchasing power. So, if you used to buy a car abroad, uh, and the exchange rate say was one naira to the dollar, one 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 hundred naira to the dollar, and you had um, five hundred. Um, if you have one million naira, uh, you you be able to buy a car of a couple of uh, thousand dollars at a time. So if the exchange rate now appreciates, the dollar appreciates, you need more than what you usually need you have to add more naira to where you have to buy the same car so it reduces the country's international purchasing power kids that their parents would normally send them schooling abroad they would have to uh, rethink so there is a substitution effect so what that means is there are foreign goods and services that nigerians can provide them locally like education is one of them instead of sending their kids abroad, they will say it's more expensive and it's maybe 10 times cheaper for them to send their kids uh, to private universities in Nigeria. So they will substitute. Or if they insist that they want to send their kids abroad, they may have to more than double the amount of Naira at their disposal. So they have to work hard to earn more money so that may boost economic activities locally. Or if they are corrupt politicians, they will steal more. So corruption would go, would rise in an attempt for people to raise more money to pay for foreign goods and services. So that is one. And in situations where there are no substitutes, like in the Nigerian case, we have a lot of goods that we buy them from abroad that we don't have strong substitutes for them. Their prices will rise and inflation would be imported into the country through that. So maybe much later on, if I'll talk about um, what we need to do, I will shed more light on that. Thank you. So over the past week, we have seen appreciation in the Naira, and this is following some of the news effect from government announcement. First, they announced that they are able to secure about $10 billion from the paid case, the one in the UK. Also, the government is saying that they are trying to clear the backlog of over seven billion in the banking sector. So, put together all of this, we are seeing appreciation in the Naira. But as we know, this is a short-term mediation team in the market. But after the whole of the ten billion dollars, as it were, is exhausted, we we'll come back to 
the problem that is the structural problem that is holding us back in terms of our naira value so what are the things that you think that can be done to sustain the strength of the naira at least to maintain the stability such that we won't be having persistent fall in the currency okay thanks um so let's let's start by correcting an impression here the value of the naira is not appreciating it's not uh it's only recovering because it was better than what it is so if if your currency falls from um five five uh, 100 naira to 500 um naira and it then moves to 495 is not an appreciation it's a recovery until the naira return to its glory day values glory days value then we have not yet uh, fully recovered to start appreciating so the question you ask what can we do to stop all of these things and maintain a stable value of the currency there are lots of things involved and i don't think we have much of the time to talk about it it has to do with policy it has to do with politics it has to do with the economy and it has to do with deliberate in fact is it's a short long and medium time approaches that have to be moving in to get the problem solved for a, for a long time to come but much of it rests with politicians let me let me say this here and 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 I, and I hope maybe it resonates with what some people think as well if we have leadership that can do two of these things we are not just on the path to getting the narrow back but we would see the entire economic system rebounding number one staff your economic management team with experts number two take your hands off them and shield them from politics let them be independent of politics now nigeria has never had shortage of ideas to move the nation forward so the first condition is always there there are great ideas great people but politics is always interfering with the process and that is why we still have these things repeating themselves over and over there is a lot to talk about this and to dig into all of these things but we don't have much of the time so to just give a summary answer to your question is the naira is in this situation because there is the the, the dollar is in short supply compared to, um, there is there is more demand for the dollar than the dollar is available to meet the demand just put it that way so if you supply the dollar a lot you would get the value of the naira go up but how do you do that what's the big problem so the the political atmosphere the economic the political lands political atmosphere in the last 10 years has altered the economic landscape and the economic landscape is not really favorable for many people there is this guy who was talking about um his book he was saying something paul collier when he was talking about um Cuba in his book The Bottom Billion he said when a nation offers no hope of economic prosperity to its citizens the smart ones would work hard not to improve the country but to escape so we've seen a massive wave of Nigerians leaving the country and they are not going to spend they are not going to spend any currency outside other than foreign currency they are not going to spend the naira outside so they are selling off some are selling off their assets they are transferring their portfolios to foreign investments they are moving their monies they want to go and resettle abroad and we see that is pumping up the demand for the dollar now to to defend the currency and to make it strong and stable first of all is to shield it from fluctuation in international oil prices so and 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 how do you defend the currency from um international foreign prices in the past government built up reserves and when there is falling oil price it uses a reserve to defend the currency now there are four commodities 
that Nigerians consume a lot. And that is taking chunk of our ex- forex. So if we can start focusing on our local industries that will produce these goods and services so that we don't import them, that would diminish our demand for the forex to pay for all of these things. Number one is pharmaceutical products. Number two, building materials. Number three, clothing and footwear. And number four, food items. So these are four major commodities in the short run that if we can improve on our agricultural system and our industries to close the international, to to meet up the international demand and now uh, to meet up the domestic demand. And when we're talking about that, we're not saying a, a lawmaker or a politician would stand up and say, oh, buy Nigerian shoe. I also buy it. Let's put a law that forces you to buy Nigerian food, uh, Nigerian goods. Uh, that's not the best way to go about it. You end up destroying welfare of consumers. What if they buy these goods and they are substandard and they are not of high quality? So it's to improve their quality. Um, government can spend a lot of money in involving people in research and development that will come up with ways to produce high quality good at lowest possible prices and this would lower average costs of production and lower the prices of these goods and Nigerians can feel comfortable uh, patronizing local goods and demand for foreign goods would fall and as a result the demand for dollar would also fall. So these are some of the short term, um, medium term interventions. In the short term intervention is now, we say we've unified the, the, the exchange rate, but the exchange rate is not unified. You go to central bank, you get, a, you, get a, you get a rate different from when you go to the commercial bank and when you also go to the black market or money transfer agents online. So we still have multiple exchange rates. Now, what we need to do is, in my view, we can only have two exchange rates. And it's not just about having the two exchange rates, but we have to make them work. And what are these two exchange rates? One exchange rate by the central bank, and it should be fixed at a very, very low rate. The government can bring it down to as low as what it was almost 10 years ago. And then the second exchange rate should be exchange rate given that commercial banks are allowed to sell the currency. So if the government say we're selling central bank is selling the dollar for 100 naira then you can you can regulate commercial banks to put a profit of maybe five dollar or ten dollar on top ten naira five naira or ten naira on top and any any price above that they should be sanctioned for doing that now you have only two exchange rate and then just like they once announced that they banned the beirut change the beirut change uh, the black market people, uh, the lots of them operate under the clock of darkness. Um, they finance their underground the economy. They finance illegal activities. So people don't care about the red, whatever the red, they rush to go and buy it there because most of the monies they use to buy it are ill-gotten wealth. So ban the Peru the change and criminalize the activities there. But when Nigerians need the money to go abroad to carry out legitimate functions like schooling or medical, they should be able to get it from the center, from, from the commercial bank. They should be able to, if they don't get it from the commercial bank, you push them to the black market and the black market is resurrected again. So the government has to make it work that way and to just give these currencies to people. And they have to put in a lot of enforcement um, a keep serious eye on commercial banks and, 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 and the way they go about this transaction. I'll tell you two things. One, there was a guy who said, um, he worked with a commercial bank and said, when central bank give out loans in foreign currency to businesses to import goods to uh, improve their industries, they sell, they, they go back through the commercial banks and individuals buy them and use them back other, other than that. And second instance was when they when when they sell the currency for Nigerians to travel abroad, they go to the airport and meet Beirut change and they buy it back from the Beirut change people and bring it back in the black market and keep selling. So it was never used for the purpose. So there has to be strict enforcement for that. And our industries have to be very strong and produce the things that will always rush to abroad. But there are things that even in the next 100 years, I'm not dying playing Nigeria's capability. We don't have the copyright for these things 
to produce them, but we need them. Even for the next hundred years, we cannot produce these things. We have to rely on the rest of the world for that, uh, for those things. But these four items I mentioned that take substantial part of our forex, we need to uh, start working on industries that can make these things work. Uh, well, thank you. But then I will may, 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 maybe a, a, a backtrack. You know, as much as uh, we, we we want we want to look at the market situation, we still feel that the government should track the government price should track what the market is. Although we know that over the years, the speculative behavior in the market has over over pressured the currency downward. But then we still feel the market needs to come in. And I totally agree with you that a lot of enforcement needs to come to play. There are a lot of people are getting away with so many criminal activity in that space that the government needs to, to actually to actually bring in a stronger hand to address some of the issues that are happening in the space. So thank you for that uh, for that one. So I would like to yes, you mentioned earlier that um, one of the major things that pressured the currency downward over the past decade is the the movement of uh, investment out of the country due to the the issue around the confidence in the economy and all of that. So they are, now we are looking, we have seen the president going around the world trying to entice investors and all of that. So we want to bring in money as much as possible. We saw that he went to meet a couple of Nigerian in the Diaspora Association here and there to let them realize that you guys can bring your money back. So, uh, as it stands, well, which of these instruments, this foreign instrument that comes in to form our, for, uh, that, that forms part of our forex inflows, do you think Nigeria should chase in the short to medium term in terms of remittance, portfolio investment, and FDI? Which of these instruments do you think? the government needs to chase to support the Naira in the short to medium term? And how do we facilitate the inflow of these instruments? Well, um, when you talk about trying to bring in more money into the system, have it also at the back of your mind that those bringing in these monies are bringing the money with the intention that the money will multiply for them. And once the money multiplies as the profit they make from these monies, they are not going to leave these profits in the country. They have to repatriate them. They have to move them out again, right? So the value that the foreign direct investment creates for the system is the jobs that people get and, and some other economic benefits and the transfer of knowledge. Other than that, it's just bringing the capital. And for remittances, um, so there is an illusion about remittances that we need to understand. They always announce that Nigerians send home every year $25 billion. That money rarely hits our external reserves. Otherwise, we would have been seeing a lot of that helping our currency. So what happens in the forex market internationally is when you sell the dollar, if someone living abroad wants to send money to Nigeria, and he says, say he sends one thousand dollars. The company that transfers the money would collect the one thousand dollars and not send it to the central bank in Nigeria or any commercial bank or uh, or sending it to our reserves in any way. That one thousand dollars will be kept with the company that sells the money. And when someone in Nigeria wants some dollars. To carry transaction abroad they will sell that dollar to that person and so there is cross border transaction but there is no fiscal movement of the money across the border so the guy in nigeria moves his naira to the guy that the guy in abroad wants to send the money to so there is an illusion it never hits the reserves and you hardly can get that and attracting foreign direct investment you have to create a climate that will encourage people to bring in their money and there are three things two things majorly that the government will have to do to create the uh, create a climate for that number one is to improve our infrastructure because if infrastructure um is not in place say electricity you raise the average cost of doing business and nobody want to operate business in such an environment 
uh, are, are treating. So the, the cost of doing business would be very high. So, But if infrastructure are in place, you lower the average cost of business and people will be encouraged to bring in their capital. And the second thing is um, we have to fight against insecurity in the country because the image of insecurity is discouraging investors to bring in their fortunes to invest in the country. They are not guaranteed that if they bring in this money and they can take them out at the time that they want to. And the third thing, which is very, very important, is our institutions, especially the legal institutions. So our legal institutions have to protect property right. They have to be there. So, for instance, if an investor brings in money and he buys equity in Nigerian business, um, he he wants to withdraw it based on the law and the law is not there to protect his interests and he has to go to court he's going to spend 10 20 15 years in court it doesn't make sense so the legal institution has to be unambiguously clear and to support investment support investors the infrastructure has to be there power is the main problem and we need to solve that as well to encourage uh the inflow of foreign direct investments Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Sapel. Our time has far been spent. We really appreciate your time and um, the insight you have shared on the issue of Naira, Naira yeah. Yeah. evaluation. Thank you there's very one, much. One, there's one thing I forget to talk about in terms of the solution. So um, I've always said this and I'll repeat it again. The central bank of any country is very crucial to the economic stability of that country. Nigeria is not excluded. Uh, so um, for the central bank to be able to function very well, it has to be independent of the executive branch of government. If that has not happened, then the central bank would find it difficult to bring about price stability and manage exchange rates. Now, theoretically, there are pointers as to if a central bank is independent or not. Number one is, if you have high frequency turnout of central bank governors. So, if central bank governor is expected to be in office for a time of five years, maximum two times, ten years in office, and you always have a situation where Whenever there is a change in government, there is a change in CBN governor, that's a sign that the central bank is not independent and it will be difficult for the central bank to function effectively. And if you check back in Nigeria from 99 to that, uh, you've seen that. And, and the second, the second uh, point as to central bank is so independent is if the person who appoints the governor of the central bank is from the same region with the with the governor of the bank and since 99 you see that pattern if a president is from this the north the central bank governor is appointed from the north if the president is from the south the central bank governor is appointed from the south so these are pointers that the cbn is not um uh, independent now america a country that it's a beacon of democracy and economic success and we always aspire to be like them we, they had a central bank governor that was in office for 18 straight years and he worked under five presidents, different political parties. Alan Greenspan had served under both Democratic, de- Democrats and Republican presidents. And the reason he was kept there, they realized that our economy should not, uh, we should not allow politics to affect our own economy. So he he did a good job and when presidents come in they are convinced that he'll continue to do a good job and they allow him to function in, in the office in my own view one way for us to have a central bank that is independent is to shield it from politics why can't you throw it out open um and say if you want to be a cbn governor of nigeria sent in your cv and there should be an independent maybe external they are a recruitment firm abroad that should sieve out CVs of best friends they can find and then bring them to the Senate to approve. And once the guy is in power, he cannot be removed by the president except of, for misconduct or some mistakes that is destroying the economy. Uh, Britain brought their Bank of England governor from Canada. So 
this is one of the ways to just make the central bank independent so that it can function very well in building a resilient economy. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. We've had an insightful conversation. We hope, you, we hope to have you on board another time. Thank you too. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>